So, so this is uh, East Asia, and uh, whoops, I turned it off. Okay, right. So, is there a uh, is there a laser in this thing? Yeah. Okay, right. So, uh, just there's a lot of there's been a lot of interest in plutonium in in this region. Uh, you know, you have Russia and China, which are nuclear weapon states. Uh, you have Japan, which, which uh, Henry's mentioned, uh, has uh, in country about uh, 10 tons of plutonium. And depending on whether you use the uh, IAEA's metric of 8 kilograms for the first Nagasaki type weapon, or the 4 kilograms, uh, which is the lowest number unclassified number you can use for what's in the U.S. nuclear weapons, uh, you, you, that corresponds to, uh, as, as Henry said, either you know, uh, more than more than a thousand or more than two thousand nuclear weapon equivalents. Um, and they have built, they are building, or they have built, in fact it was supposed to be online in 1997, it's been slightly delayed. <laughs> a, a reprocessing plant which is designed to separate eight, kil eight tons of plutonium, up to eight tons of plutonium a year, so a thousand or two thousand weapons worth a year. Um, it's currently the, the, the 24th delay has put the projected start date in 2021. Uh, then there's South Korea, uh, and uh, South Korea uh, once briefly had a nuclear weapons program. It was it was shut down under U.S. pressure. Uh, but the interest in plutonium has lived on in uh, the Korean Atomic Energy Research Institute, and they they've uh, made uh, their uh, the the fact that South Korea is being treated differently from Japan into a major political issue uh, in. Uh, during the um, rene renegotiation of the U.S. Uh, South Korea One Two Three Agreement, um, and, and uh, with, with the result, as, as Henry mentioned, that the uh, the issue was not resolved. It, they called it nuclear sovereignty, and, they, you know, and uh, uh, the issue was not resolved. It was kicked down the road by a ten-year uh, joint study uh, between the plutonium enthusiasts in this country and, and plutonium enthusiasts <laughs> in, in South Korea. Uh, and in 2021, we, the issue, you know, they, they will report back on, on their conclusion, uh, which I really worry about. Uh, so, so South, and then uh, Taiwan, whoops. Taiwan um, uh, did have a, a, a nuclear weapons program uh, which was which was shut down um, uh, in, in a definitive way by uh, the U.S. in 1988, and, the, and David Albright has a very good uh, book, book out, out on that. Um, so basically, everything you see has been touched by plutonium or their desire for plutonium. Um, now, the plutonium. It's ambiguous because there's, you know, there was a, 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 dr a dream. I mean, plutonium was first separated, obviously, from the Nagasaki bomb, <coughs> and is at the heart of every U.S. Uh, nuclear weapon, uh, and probably, you know, almost all the other nuclear weapons in the, in the world. Uh, but there was also uh, already during the Manhattan Project, there was a vision. Uh, for nuclear energy, which depended on plutonium. The, the problem was that they, they uh, thought that uranium was scarce, uh, or uranium uh, in re reasonable grade ores was scarce, and that nuclear power could be and should be the, 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 electric, the source of electric power of the future. And so they and the, the, the first uh, reactors that were developed, um, and a, a 
ultimately the, the ones which have which still predominate today, the water cooled reactors, which were developed originally for submarines uh, in this country, really use efficiently only U2, chain reacting U-235, which is less than 1% of, of natural uranium, 7 tenths of a percent. And so here you had a scarce resource and used very inefficiently. And so the question was, could they use, devise a way to use uranium more efficiently? And Leo Zillard, who originally invented the chain reaction uh, before World War II, uh, and, and then um, was partnered with Enrico Fermi in, in building the first uh, nuclear reactor here in, in the uh, squash court under the uh, the uh, football field or next to around the football next, under the football stands at the University of Chicago. He uh, during in 1945 uh, uh, the the job of completing the arrangements for plutonium production for for the uh, Nagasaki bomb, which turned out to be the Nagasaki bomb. He invented a, a plutonium breeder reactor, basically a reactor that would be fueled by plutonium and would, would uh, be able to make more plutonium than it consumed by converting the abundant isotope in uranium, U-238, into plutonium, so that it would be 100 times more uh, it, uranium efficient than the reactors that we have with us today. Now, you know, if, if uh, Glenn Seaborg, who was the, who had uh, uh, co-won a Nobel Prize for discovering plutonium and other transuranic elements, was the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission for the, the entire 1960s. And he thought this idea, and he coined the term a plutonium economy, the future of the, econ future of the world the energy system was going to be based on plutonium. And you can see how that could be done uh, physically because uh, on average the Earth's crust contains three grams of uranium per ton. <coughs> Each gram of, your, of uranium is worth, is, has the energy equivalent efficient of three tons of coal so you have, you, you basically, the breeder reactor would turn the Earth's crust into the equivalent of uh, a nine times more concentrated form of energy than coal. So, you know, we, we you know, the, the uh, breeder people had solved the world's energy problems for millennia, they thought. The only, the only problem uh, was well, the one problem was, and, and, and Seaborg should have understood this, he was the person who, who uh, figured out the first ways in which to separate plutonium out of, out of uh, irradiated, irradiated uranium, so-called reprocessing, what we call reprocessing now. And it was for the Nagasaki bomb, so that, you know, you're, you're, you're now proposing to make the fuel of the future be a nuclear weapons material. And, uh, and we, we woke up to that in uh, 1974 after Seaborg had gone, uh, when one of the countries, I mean, Seaborg wasn't envisioning this just for the United States, but for the whole world, it was going to be run on plutonium. And one of the countries we co cooperated with was India. And, and uh, so they, you know, we gave them, we and the Canadians gave them a reactor, they separated plutonium with training that we provided, and I, I don't know, maybe equipment as well. And then the first thing they used their plutonium for was to test the nuclear explosion. <laughs> uh, they said that um, it was a peaceful nuclear explosion, uh, which, which was actually uh, the, the stage for that had been set by, the, by our, our nuclear weapons labs who, who, uh, who invented the idea of peaceful nuclear explosions to make to make harbors and canals and, and so on, and and, and, uh, and even even uh, they were going to use uh, peaceful explosions to frack for fracking. Mm -hmm. uh, they even tested a couple of those a uh, couple of times in Colorado. The only problem was the gas was natural gas produced was radioactive, and people didn't like that. 
so so and fortunately uh, it turned out that uranium was at least a thousand times more abundant than, than they imagined during the Manhattan Project. Lots of uranium was found. And breeder reactors, uh, the, the, in order to, for, to breed, they had to use fast neutrons. They couldn't use um, water-cooled reactors they had, because the water slows the neutrons down too much. Um, and so they used sodium, liquid sodium. And liquid sodium burns on exposure to air or water. And we live in a world of air and water. <laughs> and, and so the, re the reliability of, of uh, prototype breeder reactors, you know, uh, in terms of the percentage of time they operated, ra ranged from zero to, zero to 20 percent. Uh, but, but except in Russia, where they, you know, they, they, just, went, they just powered on through the fires. Um, so, um, so anyway, so the, so we're still, this is now 50 years later, we're, we're still, uh, uh, a couple, a couple countries are still building prototype breeder reactors, Russia, has a, actually a couple are operating, China has just launched the construction of one, India has, has built one, it's about 10 years overdue, but it's, constantly expected to be operating next year. Oh, you forgot one country. For which? Um, at 3.5 billion, it just went up from 2 billion to 3.5 billion in its first six months. The United States is building a versatile test, test reactor, which is actually a modified PRISM General Electric Hitachi breeder reactor. Right. Uh, so that we can build fast reactors in cooperation with South Korea and Japan, but we don't want to cooperate with China because the regulations note that that would be dangerous. We hope we'll be able to kill that, but, but uh, we'll Good see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this, so, so anyway, also, uh, you know, the, the reprocessing of I mean, about one person, when, a, when spent fuel comes out of a uh, water-cooled reactor, the, you know, the, of which we have about 100 in this country, it's about 1% plutonium. And so the idea was to use this plutonium as start-up fuel for these breeder reactors, which never came. And so a number of, a, a number of countries, uh, we actually quit in the, in the, we, uh, in the uh, 1980. Thanks to uh, thanks to uh, President Carter and the invisible hand of the oh, wait market. A I had something. Yeah, we killed Yeah, well, you and I did. Well, okay. Well, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we, but but we had to, but we, the government people had to actually just do it. Yeah. We we helped we helped convince them. Yeah. Uh, so so, but nevertheless, uh, the momentum of these reprocessing programs, even though the breeder reactors didn't happen, uh, resulted in, a, in an accumulation of a pretty respectable amount of civilian plutonium. In fact, more, at this point, more civilian plutonium that was produced by Russia and the United States for nuclear weapons during uh, the Cold War. And UK finally is stopping. The reason it's stopping is, is, is funny. Uh, the, the UK nuclear establishment, you know, nuclear energy establishment went bankrupt and was bought by Electricity de France. Uh, Electricity de France reprocesses in France, uh, but we learned his preference when the, when the UK said, uh, will you renew your contract? And they said no in, in for reprocessing in the UK. So they're actually stopped, st uh, stopping. Uh, the, the, the little, Legacy fuel to be from uh, to, for, uh, to be still reprocessed, uh, but the, uh, the these other three countries and and there were customer countries uh, the the uh, uh, in Switzerland, Belgium, Germany, uh, and they they didn't renew either. Uh, they were they were sending their spent fuel to uh, uh, to UK and France. Uh, 
Russia has sort of continued trundling along uh, with this breeder program. Uh, and then France and Japan, uh, uh, neither of them have a breeder prototype at this point. Uh, but th and they were somewhat, unlike Russia, were embarrassed by all this plutonium that they were accumulating. And therefore they said, well, what we can, you know, until breeders come, we can use it in, in water cooled reactors. And, the, and so they, they uh, and this has actually happened in France. It, it's, uh, it, it's hung up in Japan. Uh, and the, the, so what they do is they take the plutonium, they mix it with depleted uranium, and they make something called mixed oxide fuel, which is a substitute for low enriched uranium fuel, which only costs 10 times as much as the low enriched uranium fuel. Uh, and the, I just translated for you there the, you know, the 30,000 to 60,000 nuclear weapons equivalent of the, of the civilian plutonium. Uh, so the rationales for the countries that, that continue, uh, uh, Russia's nuclear establishment uh, uh, says, well, we don't, actually, when I first went to, uh, went to, uh, uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll tell the story. Uh, when I first went to Russia, I, I, uh, I met the president of the Soviet Academy of Sciences, who had uh, been, who had actually designed the reactor which blew up in Chernobyl. Uh, and I asked him, how much, how much uh, uranium does Russia have? And he said, well, that's a secret. He says, but let's assume that when God put uranium on the world, in the world, he didn't know which would be the capitalist and which would be the communist countries. So let's assume that uh, that the, this is the Soviet Union at that point has as much uranium as the United States. So, that was, that's, so but, but they don't, but they worry still about scarcity of uranium. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, therefore they're continuing this breeder program, uh, development program, uh, and, it, but in fact, the, uh, and they just completed one, a prototype. The people, the breeder people want to build another prototype. The uh, Russ Anor Gatum, which is the nuclear utility, says the next one has to be has to be uh, economically competitive, and so we'll see what happens. Uh, they, and we're not going to decide until 2021. So we'll, a lot's going to happen in 2021. Uh, China, I think, just just wants to acquire technology, and uh, and so they they um, are built are. So far, they failed. They they have a brief, they built an experimental breeder which doesn't work, experimental reprocessing plant that doesn't work, and so the, the Chinese government gave them money to do the same on a larger scale, and they also want to buy from France a reprocessing plant like the one that France sold to Japan, uh, and like the one that France built for itself. The one in France works. The one in Japan doesn't. Uh, but the problem is that they have they haven't been able to cite it. And actually, there is Chinese after Fukushima. The, the Chinese are very nervous about their technology, and they actually it came out that they were going to cite this French reprocessing plant on a coastal city. In the coastal city, there were demonstrations in China that, in fact, uh, they concluded they couldn't build it there. So it's very interesting. Uh, South Korea, they argue that um, a, a radioactive waste repository for spent fuel would be too big for South Korea, a small country, to accommodate. Uh, when you look at actually the size of the radioactive waste repository, it'd be about the same area as the size of a nuclear power, power plant in South Korea. So it's hard to understand the argument, but that's the argument. And then I mentioned Taiwan. So then, then the um, well, when, you know, we, we are holding the, the South Koreans and the Japanese in check, uh, really, uh, with with regard to uh, 
nuclear weapons programs, when they do polls in South Korea, the majority wants a nuclear weapon uh, against North Korea. Uh, Japan, they want a nuclear weapon option, and they've been satisfied with that for, for um, 50 years. Uh, and, uh, you know, basically, uh, we tell them, please don't do that, and so far they've listened to, to us. And I've mentioned Taiwan already. Uh, so what's, what's the alternative to reprocessing? Uh, in this, this country, we haven't been able to set, uh, spend fuel repository. So what we do is, is, is uh, just store the spent fuel on site in dry casks. This is uh, the Connecticut Yankee, all that's left of the Connecticut Yankee nuclear power plant. All the 90% of the fuel that was produced by, by that reactor during its lifetime. It sits in the woods. Uh, in, in, uh, and that's, that's a much cheaper option than building uh, in France. It's, I mean, in Japan, it's, it's, a, it's a more than a $20 billion reprocessing plan. Uh, and finally, on the, you know, we're, we're next week we're talking with North Korea uh, and about, uh, about denuclearization, and I have to uh, conjure up the, uh, the Peninsula Denuclearization Agreement, which defined denuclearization as, for the whole peninsula, as not including reprocessing and not including enrichment. And so I hope we can, we can go back to that.